A couple of years back, I was looking at some short introductions to Buddhism, and I was struck by a pattern that was common to many of them. They start out by saying that Buddhism is a religion of self-reliance. You don't rely on a god. You don't rely on any outside power. You do the practice yourself. And then toward the end of the guide, they would say, one of the teachings is that there is no self. And you wonder why people reading those guides would be interested to read any further. The first statement is true. We are here relying on ourselves. You're here sitting here meditating. Nobody else is doing the meditating for you, and it's not simply happening on its own. You have to make the decision that you're going to do this and you're going to benefit from it. But as for the statement the Buddha taught that there is no self, that's not true at all. He never said anything like that. In fact, he said that even the question of whether there is a self or is not a self was one to be put aside. Because if you answered it either way, yes or no, you'd get entangled in what he called a thicket of views. And it would get in the way of looking at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, which are the definition of right view, the right view that helps lead to the end of suffering. So what is this teaching on not-self? Well, look back at those Four Noble Truths. The first truth, suffering, is defined as clinging aggregates, or five of them all together. Form, which is your sense of the body, your feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain, your perceptions, the labels that you put on things, thought fabrications, the way you put thoughts together, and consciousness, which is aware of all these things. And these are all activities, and we cling to them. That's what the suffering is, and, and the clinging. And we cling either because we find that they give rise to sensual pleasure as we engage in these activities, or we cling to certain ways of doing things and saying, this has to be the way this is, and it has to be that way. We get almost ritualistic or obsessive in our ideas about how things should be done. We cling to our views, and we cling to doctrines of the self. Now, these are all activities. It's good to remember that. Your sense of self is an activity. And the question is, to what extent does it lead to suffering, and to what extent does it actually help put an end to suffering? This is the process of what the Buddha calls eye-making and my-making. It's a kind of fabrication. It comes under the aggregate of fabrication. It's also perception. You slap a label of your, who you are, either on your body or related to the body. As the Buddha said, it can be either you identify with the body itself, or you identify that you are in the body, or the body's in you or the body belongs to you, and you can define yourself around any of the other aggregates in the same way. And there's a duty with regard to these things. Each of the Four Noble Truths, the duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it, i.e. to develop dispassion for it. The duty with regard to the cause is to abandon it. The cessation of suffering is to be realized, and the path is to be developed. Now, it's in the developing of the path that you actually use your sense of self. You develop a healthy sense of self here. The Buddha talks about being responsible. You have to be your own mainstay. You have to be the person who judges your actions. And you have to have a sense that you're able to do this. The technical language of the Pali calls this mana or conceit, but it's not conceited in the way we think of it in English. It's simply the idea of, I'm good enough to do something or I'm not good enough to do something. And in this case, even though ultimately we have to go beyond that, either, either good enough or not good enough, but we do have to have the sense that we are good enough to do this. There's a passage where Venerable Ananda expresses it this way. He says, you think about other people who have gained awakening, They're, they can do it, why can't I? They're human beings, I'm a human being. Why can't I do what they can do? You might call that the self as the producer, or the self as the provider. And then the self as the consumer, the one who's going to benefit from all this. 
And the Buddha uses this many, many times, even passage where he says, learn how to see what is not yours as not self, and it will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. So you're going to benefit from this. There are times, he says, when the practice gets difficult, and one of the ways of keeping yourself on course is to remind yourself that you started out on this path to put an end to suffering. And if you stop practicing this path, you're closing off the way to the end of suffering. Do you love yourself? Do you care for yourself? That's the self as we call some Buddha calls us governing prevent principle, or it's the self as the consumer, the one who's going to benefit. So there are passages or pa parts of the path where you do need to have a good, healthy sense of self, it's competent, responsible, taking the long-term view. Which is why the idea of there is no self would be actually counterproductive on the path. There are many perceptions that the Buddha has you use in a strategic way that you don't put aside, but the idea that there is no self doesn't have any strategic use. Now the perception of not-self comes in when you realize there are things that you don't want to identify with, and it's not something foreign to us. It's a perception we've used many times in the past. You think of doing a particular action, you say, no, it's beneath me. Okay, that's not-self. You think of a possible course of action, you realize it wouldn't be worth it. Okay, you say, nope, I'm not going to go there. Not-self. But all too often, though, we get pretty random in our application of not self and not-self. We identify self as things that are actually not in our own best interest, and we say not-self to things that are in our best interest. So the Buddha wants us to be a little bit more systematic in this. So right now as you're practicing concentration, well, you're the one doing it. You're the one who's going to benefit. Any thoughts that come up that are not related to your concentration, you can label them as not-self. Remembering that both self and not-self are perceptions, and you want to learn how to use them well. So you're not just clinging to them, but you're actually turning them into a path. So we're not here to decide whether or not there is a self or there is no self. We're here to learn how to use the functions of the mind in a skillful way. Now there will come a point at the end of the path. Where you've developed the path as far as it can go, and you're going to have to let it go. That's when you apply the perception of not-self to everything that's related to the path. Even your concentration and your discernment, you've got to let those go at that point. But it's not the case that you let them go and they're, they're gone. Simply you're no longer clinging to them. Even your first perception of the deathless, the Buddha says, you have to label that as not-self. Otherwise, you cling to it, and that gets in the way of a full awakening. But as for the awakening itself, that's something that lies outside the aggregates. There's no perception in there, so perceptions of self wouldn't apply. Perceptions of not-self don't apply. Fabrications of self or not-self don't apply. And John Mahabhu has a nice comment on this. Years back there was a controversy. There was a, There is a sect north of Bangkok that started advertising saying that nirvana is your true self. And there was a huge uproar. It even got into the newspapers. Can you imagine? The New York Times, the Daily News. Is nirvana self? Is nirvana not self? And someone took the question to a Jamaha boy. And his answer was, well, nirvana is nirvana. And he says, if you label it as self or not self, you're, as he said, you're putting shit all over something that's really good. There's no sense of self there, but even the perception of not self, that's part of the path. He says, like a stairway going up to a house. You use perceptions of self and not self on the stairway, but then you have to let go of the stairway if you're going to get into the house. 
we're not here to prove whether or not there is a self. We're not here even to focus on the question of whether there is, is or not a self. We're here focusing on the question of why is this suffering? What am I doing that's causing suffering? What can I do to stop? Because this isn't the big problem in life. We're constantly acting, constantly making choices, all for the purpose of happiness. But so many times they lead to suffering. What are we doing wrong? So that's where we should focus our attention. And then we use these perceptions of self and not-self as they're helpful in trying to solve that problem. And when the problem is solved, it's, it's the ultimate happiness. It's not a happiness, it's a feeling. The Buddha simply says it's, it's outside of the aggregates. It's an awareness that's outside of the aggregates. And as for who's there, the Buddha, Buddha wouldn't answer, except when the arahant dies. You can't say he or she exists or doesn't exist or both or neither. And John Sowat has a nice way to say it. He says, when you gain the ultimate happiness, you don't really care if there's a self or not. That's not an issue then. The happiness itself is totally sufficient. So learn to use these perceptions well. And look at your sense of self as an action. It's a type of karma. And then the question is, when is it skillful and when is it not? And one of the things you discover as you develop more of the skills of the path is that your sense of yourself will change. This is a truth that applies to all skills. If you get really good at playing the piano, your sense of who you are is going to change as you get really good at that. You get really good as a cook, you get really good at any skill. You're going to be a different person. And your sense of what you can do will change. And so here's a skill you can develop. It enables you to put an end to suffering. Sometimes the path looks daunting. You say, how can I possibly do that? Well, if you follow the path, it'll turn you into the kind of person who can. Then it'll open up to a dimension where you don't need perceptions of self or not self. That's what these perceptions are for. They're strategies that we use for the sake of happiness. And all too often we misuse them. The Buddha is teaching us to use them more systematically, more skillfully. And then when the happiness is attained, you can put them aside. An image that's useful or common in the forest tradition is that you're building a piece of furniture. And while you're working on the furniture, you have to hold on to the tools, take care, good care of the tools. But when the piece of furniture is done, you can put the tools down. They've served their purpose. And then you can enjoy what you've made. The only difference here is that nirvana is not made, it's discovered. So in this case, you can say these tools, or these vehicles, I might call them, have delivered you to a good place. This is why the Buddha uses the image of the raft. The raft takes you across the river. Once you reach the other side, you don't have to carry the raft around. You don't have to be weighed down by it. And you're free to roam the other side. The Buddha discusses the path. He describes the path in a lot of detail. But then he says, for the arhats, once they've gained awakening, their path can't be traced. It's like the path of birds of the sky. 